week we have our first footballer on the show, Jay Bothroyd. Cutting in field, stays on his feet, shot, shot. shot. can, oh! Bothroyd has scored! We talk about the challenges of pursuing a football career growing up in London and the challenges of actually becoming a professional footballer. My mentality was still kind of that street mentality. Yeah, yeah. So I, I had that you know, when I was playing football in the cage, but then when I went to Arsenal, I still had that same mentality. So people would be like, he's got a bad attitude, he's got a chip on yeah. his shoulder. But Jay had a top career and he shares how he accomplished everything he wanted. The worst thing that happened and the best thing that happened was me playing for England. Because now I got a taste of and I got to see these players like Gerard, Rio, you know, all these England players. I also got to understand his mindset around money as he was going from contract to contract and onto bigger wages. I wasn't a big drinker, but I was going to spend like a few grand a weekend. Yeah. You know. Well, you said what? <laughs> what? Alcohol for my friends to enjoy. Jay, thanks for coming on, man. Pleasure, man. Pleasure. Appreciate you, appreciate you coming up. Um, how's it been? What have you been up to recently? <sighs> Just spending time with the family, really. Um, you know, I decided to finish playing football in December, so it's just spending time with the family. I've been working on Sky Sports and BT and, you know, doing the punditry and, you know, I'm enjoying that. But then, you know, I'm enjoying the school run and playing golf and, you know, just keeping myself, you know, mentally you know, busy. Yeah, this, that's the, the small thing that you don't get to do so much when you're playing, right? Like yeah. the school run. Yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I've got a four-year-old, so I never did. I've got a four-year-old and a 19-year-old. My 19-year-old, I, I never did the school run with him. You know, I picked him up from school, you know, in the, when we finished a football season and things like that. But I never had the opportunities to, like, go to school, pick him up, you know, take him swimming lessons. And yeah. There was little things that I never did. And I never had the opportunity to do because I was traveling or, you know, preparing. Like, I felt like, you know, I was one of those players that, I kind of, especially when I was young, I did used to burn the candle at both ends. But as I got older, I realised how important recovery was, and you know that kind of thing. So I did used to rest a lot and and relax rather than going out and yeah, you know, doing those kind of things. Yeah, that's interesting. When you when you say burning the candle at both ends, how does that look for you? You know, so obviously, especially if you're winning, like there's periods when you know you're going for a good time and whatnot uh, with your club and you're winning games, and you know, there was a big culture, you know, I say back in the day, but I've only just finished, but where you'd go out and celebrate with your mates as well. So yeah. if you play a midweek game, you know, you've got that high of winning, you want to continue mm. that high. So you go out with your mates, you know, you have a few beers. Or I wasn't a big drinker, to be fair, but you still go out, you're having late nights. Yeah. Then, you know, you got a Saturday game, you win that, you want to go out a Saturday. Sunday was a day off. So, you know, sometimes you might say, you know what, let's meet up on Sunday afternoon, especially in the summer. You know, and have a few, you know, be a few beers somewhere. Yeah. Um. So when I say burning a candle at both ends, that that's kind of what it was. How it looked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And you, you feel like as you got older, you kind of slowed that down a little bit. Yeah. Because you're noticing that recovery was a lot more important. Yeah, I definitely slowed that down. Um. A big, a big turning point for me. I had two really. One was when I went to Italy, mm -hmm. and I got to see how they train because I was one of those players that, you know, I always had a lot of ability. So. I didn't really look at gym training and things like yeah. that. Like I had to do that. I was just like, I want to be a master of the ball yeah, rather yeah. than be, you know, strong in the gym kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. And because I was tall anyway, I kind of could use my body and my limbs to, mm -hmm. you know, manipulate the ball and keep it away from defenders kind of thing. So for me, I mean, that that came later on. And I see what was that, that. What was that for injuries or... That, that brought that no, it, the, Italy made me see like, you know, we they used to do training sessions and I had to do it. Okay. So when I went to Italy, that they would do like a weight session in the morning, like squats and things like that to kind of get your legs yeah. and muscles ready. And I wasn't really doing that. I couldn't, I, I couldn't even lift weights and squat weights. You know, I was embarrassing. I was doing <laughs> like, I was squatting like 50 kilos or something like that. Yeah. You know, because I just felt stiff afterwards. So I got to see it then. But then when I was at Cardiff, Craig Bellamy came um, on loan initially and I got to see the way he recovered and prepared mm. for games and I looked at that and thought you know what if I'm gonna play into my late 30s and in my 30s then I need to be doing what he's doing because you know he was so professional so I yeah. kind of copied his mold yeah that's interesting about Italy though I wouldn't have thought that you'd think yeah. like Italy was just more like on your mindset on your yeah. wave in terms of like ball mastery and yeah it's not really a, a physical yeah, no, place, I've, isn't it? Yeah, uh, to be fair, I thought the same thing. So like when we went 
pre-season. I thought it was just a pre-season thing, but then this thing carried on <laughs> into the season. So like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, <laughs> like we're doing squats and weights and, you know, all this kind of thing. And I, I mean, I had to adjust to it because I had to, you know, I couldn't just say oh, I ain't doing it. Because you know, then obviously I'm going to upset people. So I had to do it then. But even when I came back from Italy, I, can't, I stopped doing it again. And, and I only did it if I was injured or something. Right. Or if you, feel, I, you feel a big difference? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Like, because when I first started doing it, I always felt like, I don't know if you've done it, but I always felt lethargic mm. within my body afterwards, like a few days afterwards. And I didn't like that feeling. Yeah. So it kind of made me not really want to put effort into doing the gym stuff. But then... I know what you mean. Yeah, as I've got mean. older, I've kind of realized that it's important, very important, because it can prevent injuries. Yeah. So, you know, for me, I've been blessed. That, you know, I never had any operations or anything like that. I just had like muscle pulls here and there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think that was due to me actually using the gym and taking that seriously. And then I changed my diet. I stopped eating meat. Um, so I, I Vegan, been, right? You've been vegan yeah, for a while. Yeah, so, I mean, to be honest... When I was in Japan, I had to. I started eating fish because over there it's really difficult to. It's, I mean, it's they didn't really have vegan options. You know, nowadays yeah. over here you go to a restaurant, you can eat. There's vegan options everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, you go to, you know, a cafe, you can have like oat milk, rice milk, all that. There's the options now. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Japan, some countries are far behind. Aren't yeah, they? yeah. So they didn't have that. Like if I say to someone, "Do you have almond milk?" They looked at me funny, like. <laughs> No, no, we have skimmed yeah. soy milk, but you know, and I don't, yeah. I don't really like soy milk, so it's kind of I end up just having black coffee, mm -hmm. you know. So it, it, over there I was eating fish, but since I've been back, you know, I've been pretty much vegan. Yeah. No, I feel your pain. I've been vegan for like four and a half years. Yeah, and um, do you, oh, do you miss the taste of meat? Do you, do you have the taste of meat still? Can you taste it? Do you un like I forgot about it now, so I've been I vegan I've, for like no, nine years, do you know, eight years. No, I can, years. I can remember it, but I don't miss it. I had something the other day that tasted like. The closest to chicken I've ever tasted since yeah. being vegan. Um, but I wouldn't say I miss it, no. I think meat was one of the easiest to, to quit. Yeah, I didn't. I, I mean, I used to, I did used to eat a lot of red meat, actually, especially when I was in Italy, because they, yeah. they really you know, pushed you towards like red meat, saying it's really good for you. It's got iron and all this kind of stuff, which, mm -hmm. you know, now I've learned about food. It's, you know, it's a bit of a myth, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it made me feel lethargic as well. Like I used to always have a nap in the afternoon. You know, I'd have like red meat and things like that and chicken and and I'd feel tired. Mm -hmm. So I was like, man, what's what's going on here? So I went to see a dietitian and he said, you know, your your metabolism is, is you know, slow. Right. And he said, obviously, when you have red meat, it takes longer to, it takes digest, longer to digest. So that's when I was like, okay, now I'm going to cut out meat. And my wife's doesn't eat meat anyway. She hasn't eaten meat since that's so important, like isn't four, it? yeah. So yeah. it wasn't like she she could cook really good meat anyway. Yeah, so yeah. it just made it easy. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, no, that's that's interesting. And how did you feel like do you feel yeah, so better I, straight away? Yeah, yeah. I don't sleep in the afternoon anymore. I don't do none of that. I've just I feel you like kind of stay got, quite steady throughout the whole day, don't yeah, you? Exactly. Rather than like dips, dips and dips, yeah, exactly. So like for me, now I don't you know, I go I don't sleep in the afternoon, I don't nap, I just wake up in the morning yeah. at like 6, 7 a.m. and then I'm going through to like 10, 11. How, how long have you been vegan for? Eight, nine years, something like that. Do you know what? Uh, you must have had some really tough times, you know, because even now, from when you probably first went vegan to where it is now, it's improved massively in terms of like options. Yeah, yeah. But I still saying. go to like away games. Yeah. So when you go to hotels yeah. and some of the, uh, the options are horrendous, man. Yeah, I'd and this is now. So like, you must have struggled or well, seven years ago. I even struggled recently when I was in Japan. You still struggle now. Yeah, yeah. so I like go to the guy that sorts out all the food at hotels, and I'd be like, "Listen, I need oats for breakfast. Yeah, oats and <laughs> oh, blueberries. That's, all, that's all I need. That's all I need. Oats and breakfast. Because in Japan, they they eat normal food. Yeah, for breakfast. That's so they like have like rice and fried rice and things like that, and you know sausages and you know." Like meat they're and not chicken. big meat eaters though, are they? They in are Japan, in Japan, yeah, man. And they're, they're, China, I'm thinking. they're really influenced by the South Koreans as well. So there's like these meat restaurants where they just like fry the it's all meat basically. Yeah. So they're really influenced by meat, and they've got this again the myth like, oh, so how are you so strong? Kind yeah, of thing. yeah, yeah. You know that kind of way. But I think with these documentaries that have come on Netflix and you know it the helps. education that's out there now, I think they're slowly, slowly changing. But you know, over over in Japan. It, it takes a while. Mm. I take I take you to a little vegan joint later. Yeah, okay, no, cool. Yeah, <laughs> but no, um, all right, cool. So for people that maybe don't know you or or um or even remember you, I'm sure a lot of people would would know who you are. 
Well, you're the first footballer I've had on, had on the show, which is cool. Oh, for real? Yeah, yeah. Um, hopefully, this will bring out some others as well <laughs> to, start, to start opening up a bit. But so good to have you on. And obviously, you're retired now, yeah. just recently, which is something that we actually speak on the show with a lot of like business owners. Yeah. And there's like a, they always bring up the link between like them growing their business and that being like their baby yeah. and selling it and then yeah. linking that to retiring. It's kind of like you lose your purpose a little bit. Yeah. And they, a lot of them go through that. So we talk about it quite a lot on the show. So it'd be good to get your perspective on where you're at now after being you retired and you know, your challenges. Yeah. But um, to start off with, why don't we talk a little bit about your career, like where you started off, yeah. where you're from. Yeah, so I'm from North London, originally Archway. Um, yeah, my... Um, How did you get into it? What was your first academy? So Arsenal? No, it's QPR actually. QPR, okay. But I was playing for a team called Westwood Boys, right? Which is like a Sunday team. And, you know, I, I was saying to my dad, man, I'm, too, I'm the best footballer in my, my primary school. Like, I need to play mm. like, with better players. You know, so I always had that kind of confidence in me from the beginning. So then he took me to the Sunday team. Where do you think that came from? That came from your dad? I don't know where it came from, to be honest. I, I, I can't really put my finger on it, but I think, you know, my family wasn't wealthy. And then I, I loved football. And then, you know, you start looking at, you know, newspapers and that back in the day and you see people drive like nice cars and live in big houses and all that. Yeah. And that was kind of my motivation because I was like, okay. you know, I can see my mum like working in a school, doing two jobs. My mm -hmm. dad's working just a normal job like for British Telecom and whatnot. And I just kind of looked at it like, you know what? At that age, even I was like, that's my motivation. I don't want to be... What, what age are you talking now? Yeah, so we're, like, we're talking like nine years old. Okay. Yeah. And then... So Quite I was mature like, thinking, isn't it, for a nine-year-old? Yeah, I just, kinda, I just kind of felt like I wanted to because i used to go to jvc center right so like when my mum in the holidays when my mum and dad were working like i used to go to this jvc center at arsenal and they used to do it's like these kind of football academies or whatever soccer mm -hmm. schools and they used to like you go there in the morning you train and play football all day and then you have lunch and then you you know your parents pick you up at like four o'clock um so but during that because it was at arsenal like players would come in yeah and, you know, you see them, they dress nice, they look nice. You see that they drive in nice cars and it was all like, you know, I want that car when I'm older kind of thing. And, you know, so I see that they was living a different lifestyle to my parents. Yeah. And I was kind of like, I want, you know, I want that, you know, even at that age. And then, so I signed for, like, I stayed with Westwood Boys and that was my team. And then after a year, QPR picked me up. So it was like, I was nine, but I was going into my 10th birthday. And I was really happy about that. But then where they used to train was a distance from my house. So it was like my, my dad would like come straight from work, mm -hmm. you know, get me in, you know, his British telecom van and, you know, take me to like hang a lane. And then, you know, there was traffic and it's, you know, it was just a big pain. Mm -hmm. um, so I started playing for my school team and my district team. And then while I was playing for my district team, Arsenal approached me and said, you know, we want to sign you. And, you know, I, I left Ars I left QPR at like, you know, so I'm going on to 11 now. And, you know, I was with Arsenal and, you know, Highbury's just ran, I could walk to training. Yeah. You know, I could walk nice. to JVC Centre and do training. So it was just like perfect for me. Mm -hmm. So then, um, when, when did you join them? So I joined them at like 11, at 11. 10 and going on 11. So yeah, so I would have been 10 still, but I was yeah. going 11. Okay, and then to growing up, through that playing football and coming through the ranks there, so you say obviously finance and lifestyle was was a bit was a big drive for you. Was it more was it more than materialistic things in terms of like you know getting cars or was it a bit of both between that and giving like your your parents a better life? Because no, I, you can see that you know, was there ever like a lack of money or was you, you was always like you had what you need? No, but you, no nothing more than that. Yes, yeah, so like I used it? to get like two pairs of trainers that had to last me a year. Yeah, yeah, okay. Right, so it wasn't like, you know, and then, you know, you get towards the end of the year and I had to like put duct tape on my trainers because I knew <laughs> that I wasn't getting no new ones until like, yeah, yeah. okay, you know, the end of the school year or something. So that's what, that's where I was kind of at. And I was like, I don't want to be, you know, I, I want to have fresh, because there was, yeah. I had some friends that had fresh trainers like yeah. Jordans and stuff like I'm wearing high tech, you know, so <laughs> it's like, I can't be, you know. Yeah, uh, so you've realized that, you've realized that you're not living a certain lifestyle. Certain lifestyle, yeah. Okay. I, I used to see hot girls and I'd be like, you know what? got my high tech on, you know, <laughs> let me cross the road and say hello, you know, so they can't see my shoes and stuff like that. So like, it was kind of, I see from a young age that I had friends that were doing, the parents were doing well. And then yeah. obviously I think, you know, it wasn't like, I'm not saying I was in poverty, like I couldn't eat and stuff like that, God. but I, get you. I see there was things that I wanted that I, I couldn't get kind of thing. Yeah. And it wasn't, I played football cause I love football, but my dad always said, you know, if you, if you're a top footballer, 
money will always follow it. If mm-hmm. you're top at anything, mm-hmm. money follows it. So whether it's business, football, you know, whatever, you might be advice, yeah. a chef. If you're top of your game, you know, wealth always follows it kind of thing. So I always kept that in my mind. And I never remember like all my friends, you know, they would go out even in school, they'd go to like house parties and things mm-hmm. like that. And I remember my dad said to me, listen, you're not going out, you know, your friends ain't going to pay your bills when you're older. So, you know, you got to stay in and focus on, on what you need to do and be ready, you know, the next day when it, you, you got a football match. Yeah. Guys, let's speak jewelry for a minute. Meet Say It With Diamonds, an amazing jewelry company founded by a friend of mine, Charlotte, who you might have seen previously on this podcast. Say It With Diamonds have brilliant collections for everyone, male and female, and for any age. They launched a men's collection recently. They're also engagement ring specialists, and I can definitely vouch for them here as they did make mine, which was amazing. Visit their website, I'll go over to their Instagram page and have a look. Great quality and very affordable, but they also offer bespoke jewelry, as I mentioned, engagement rings and other diamond gifts. On their website, you'll see a member box that you can purchase for £20 for the year, which gives you one year's worth of free next day delivery and 10% off everything over £50. Even better, all the Money Game listeners can get a 15% off everything online using the code MONEY15, all in capitals. Don't play games with your jewellery, get it from somewhere trusted. And then, so from, from, how, how much did it bother you about what, what was you talking about? It didn't, it didn't bo- like bother me like I was like, be- like begging, but I just knew my situation, you know, and it kind of, it got even worse than when I went to my secondary school. Yeah, yeah, it gets people. Because, yeah, because now like, people are saying, look at your dead trainers, you know, like, <laughs> that kind of way, and people will cuss you and things like that. So <laughs> it got even worse. And then that's when I was like, you know, I, I said to my mom, I said, mom, listen, instead of buying me two pairs of trainers, just get me one and I'll make it last. <laughs> <laughs> one nice pair, two high sets. Yeah, exactly. Get me a yeah. Yeah, cool. Just get me, get me a nice pair of you know, Reebok Classics back in the day. Get me yeah. a pair of Reebok Classics and, you know, I'll be good and I'll make it last. Mm-hmm. Um, so I did that, do you know what I mean? And then, you know, things, you know, things started getting better. Um, I didn't really, you know, my mum my and dad were really good to me. They took me to all my games and they came to support me. Um, that was the biggest thing they'd done for me, but they never really had that. Um, they couldn't really give a, me advice financially mm. um, because they didn't have any money to give me for, you know, the yeah. right advice. They didn't say invest in this, invest in that. And, you know, so I kind of, I got to, you know, YTS age and, and you know, we was earning like 47 pounds a week. And so that was the first contract I got. And I was like, man, this is 47 pound a week. Like, now I'm at Arsenal every day and I'm seeing like, I'm really seeing, you know, money yeah. in front of me now. And I was like, I, 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 I can't live on this, man. You know, even though mm-hmm. like Arsenal used to give my parents like money to like feed me each month. I think it was like, I don't know, 250 quid, 300 quid to like yeah. buy my, you know, food e- each month or whatever. Must have helped though, innit? Yeah, that did help. Yeah. I mean, my mum made it work. She, she, she went going Marks and Sparks. She was going to Iceland, <laughs> you know, getting them deals like, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it helped. But then at the same time, 47 pound a week, you can't really do much with it even back then, yeah. you know? So I, I was fortunate that obviously I was one of the best players in the country and I only signed, I signed one year YTS and three year pro. Okay. You know, a lot of my team just signed three years YTS. Yeah. Um, so so, you, so you, had a, you had a jump in, in wage though? Yeah. From so after I, that first year? Yeah. So I had a jump in wage after the first year. So I went from like earning f- uh, like 47 pound a week and then I was earning like, I think it was like 850 a week. Was you happy with that? Yeah, so that for me now, I'm like, boy, now I can go and buy them Jordans. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm like, what? I was like, you know, I used to go and shop in Wood Green, you know, Wood Green, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So I used to go and shop in Wood Green and, and Crouch End and places like that. Now I'm like, let me go to the West End. <laughs> you know, now I'm like, what's, what's happening on Bond Street kind of thing? So now I'm like going to buy Yo, Gucci 8, loafers. 8, Bond Street. Yeah. <laughs> so now I'm going to buy like Gucci loafers and <laughs> Patrick Cox and things like that back in the day. And it's like... You know, I, I started doing that, but I remember Stephen Sidwell's dad, I mean, he came to me, and this is when I was earning 47 pound a week. Mm. And like, he said to me, listen, you're a very, very good player. Um, you know, try and save half your money. And at the time I was like, how can I save 47 pound a week, half my money? That's like, yeah. you know, I'm living on 20 pound now. <laughs> you know, so I, did, I, I wish I had have took that advice really. And you know, listen to that. Yeah. And then but still, that you can't save money then. Yeah, you can't save money. But then obviously when I got my got the, contract, I could have, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. But then it was just like, you know what? I, I, I like this lifestyle, you know. I'm spending my paycheck every month. Like I was mm. spending all of it, you know. And then you got to start going on holidays. And you, your lifestyle changes because it's relative, isn't it? Like 
you, you know, before like a Casio watch would be amazing. And then you start earning good money. Now I want a Giorgio Armani watch. And then you had my watch, bro. And I didn't even see that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even see that. But yeah, but then thing, you know, things change because your lifestyle changes. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, since we're speaking about money, you know, and business, you can't let, you know, your lifestyle change too much where your mm -hmm. lifestyle is more than what you're earning. Yeah, you know, yeah, and I, I, to be fair, I didn't, I didn't learn that until I was like in my twenties. Like I just used to live each day as it comes. Because when you're, you know, you're coming up, you don't, you know, all these experienced players will be like, you know, football's a short career. It's like but at the time, you don't. Now. You think, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. I still got like twenty years, <laughs> yeah. you know, kind of thing. So you don't know what's gonna happen. So you, you just think it's never gonna end. But then, before mm -hmm. you know it, you know, you're twenty eight years old or thirty years old, and it's like, shit. Yeah, what shall I do now? You know. I got four years. I got four or five. Yeah, <laughs> I got four or five years left now. You know, I need to make the most of it. But you know, I was fortunate that I did meet some. You know, some of the right people when I was like in my mid twenties, and yeah. you know, I started getting into property and things like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, as much as my career was up and down because I had a bad attitude, I think I was a, a product of my environment. To be honest, mm -hmm. you know, living in North London, and you know, going, I went to Holloway Boys. You know, I've got lots of friends from Tottenham and Hackney and. You yeah, know, you, you kind of you get in the wrong crowd, but the thing that kept me on the straight and narrow was football. Mm -hmm. But then my mentality was still kind of that street mentality. Yeah, yeah. So I I had that you know when I was playing football in the cage, but then when I went to Arsenal, I still had that same mentality. So people would be like, "He's got a bad attitude. He's got a chip on yeah. his shoulder. He, you know, he's aggressive. He wants a fight." And and I would, but just because I couldn't, you know. I couldn't change my mentality from one yeah. to the other when I needed to. Yeah. Yeah. No, interesting. And then, so like fast forwarding from there, so you're like, you're on about 850. And I think what's quite interesting is that when you start making a bit of money, you probably start seeking the things that you couldn't get when you were, yeah. when you were younger. Like obviously you, you notice trainers a lot, you'll see big on trainers. Yeah. So as soon as you start getting money, that's what you start seeking. But then yeah. fast forwarding from there, at what point did you start making real money? So like when I got, I got sold to Coventry. What what age? I think I was like nineteen. Okay. Like that. So you was on your pros up until then. Yeah. So like I was, yeah, I think it was nineteen. I got sold, and they spent like I think it was like one point three million or something like that. But at the time, it's like a lot of money for a yeah, teenager yeah, that's never played a game before. Yeah, you know? definitely. Um, and then I started earning like thousands, mm -hmm. like a couple. I think it was a couple. Yeah, two thousand maybe. But then. You know, if you get the win bonuses and things like that, yeah, it stacks up. And now mm -hmm. you're like, yeah, man, now I can go on like different holidays. So like, mm. you know, when I was like 18, 17, 18, it's like going to Napa. Yeah. You know, and you know, you could go to Napa back then, I don't know, with 250 quid and that would last you like, you know, yeah, 10 yeah. days. You know, you can make that work. And then when I started earning that kind of money, obviously now I'm in the change room with first team players and they're talking about, oh, I went to... You know, I went to the Bahamas and, you know, and I say, like, how much are the flights? And there's like, I don't know. Like, I remember, I think it was like Richard Shaw, someone like that was talking about flights and all that. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm going to get a, an economy seat. And he's like, I don't even know what happens when you turn right. I, turn, <laughs> I always turn left. So then I was like, I started thinking about this now. And I'm like, OK, I'm a tall guy. Let me see. You know, let me see what happens. You know, what, what's there kind of thing? Yeah. And then I see the flat beds and. So now I'm like, I want that. Now, you are, yeah. now I want that. And, uh, you know, this life changes, you know. You start, I started earning money. Um, I bought, I bought my first apartment. I thought, I think I bought my, yeah, I bought my first apartment when I was like 21. So your mindset at this time is now just like looking for things that are out of your budget before? Yeah, so I'm now, okay. I'm still looking at things out of my budget. Yeah, so yeah. like my, my whole, my whole life at the you beginning. Yeah, so I was like. <laughs> I was still like, well, I wasn't out my budget, but it was like on the cusp. Yeah. Where and I'd you was like, always seeking so, for, the, for the, something extra. Yeah, something extra, okay. yeah. And then when you get your bonuses, you're like, oh man, I can get even something yeah. even better now kind of thing. And at this point, there was no like, you had no financial advice. Yeah, whatsoever. I didn't have no financial advice, but then I met someone and it was through J-Lo Samuel, you know, God rest his soul. And he introduced me to him and he said, you need to buy a property. And at the time, in hindsight, I wish I had bought a property back in London. Mm -hmm. But this guy says to me, you know, wherever you go, you should always try and buy a property. So I thought that meant, you know, if you go to like live in Birmingham, buy one in Birmingham, oh, yeah, you live yeah. in Manchester, buy in Manchester. You know, 
I look at the property prices from back then to now to now in London and it's like if I had I bought that place for like mm. you know 400 grand or 300 grand back then you know yeah. it'd be worth like two three million now mm -hmm. you know that's the difference that was a big jump and I you know I didn't have that advice and you know so that was the first little seed in your mind when we started talking about that like, property and yeah, doing yeah. something so he said to me you should buy a place and at the time I got a place in the mailbox in Birmingham I don't know if you've been there but it was just being built and it was brand okay. new and I think it was like 330,000 yeah and I, that's the first piece of property that I bought and um, who, took, who took you through that, that process like, like it, was, it was him okay. this guy yeah so like it was Jay Lloyd that introduced me to him I forgot his name now to be honest but it was this it was this guy and he he, he said to me you know you should you know he sorted me out my mortgage and all that kind of you know all the le legalities that you you need to do to get a property so i ended up buying that and it was it was really good actually mm -hmm. it was really good you know i was in coventry now and i've got my own place that i own you know i'm paying my mortgage and and you, you was living there or was it yeah i was living there okay. yeah i was living there so that was my first investment okay well you know it was a good investment because i remember at the time it was like now you, you see it and it's like got all the shops in there you know it's got restaurants out the back mm -hmm. and you know it's really nice i don't know probably buying a property there would now would probably be double mm -hmm. you know maybe even more i don't know maybe 700s but it, it was a good investment i had my own apartment um you know i was the first person in my family to actually own yeah something you know so it was it was really good and then you know for me i always looked at my upbringing like I've got a small group of friends that I grew up with, right? So for me, it was always like, okay, I've made it, you know, but I want to bring my friends as well and let mm. them enjoy. And know. did you feel like that at, at that point? Yeah, that so like I, was my, I was very much like, my, you know, my friends used to come to my games, you know, they'd come and stay with me. Like even when I was living in, you know, the mailbox now, they'd mm. come and stay with me on the weekends, you know, we'd go out. For me, it was like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get it, no yeah, problem. Yeah, yeah. Like you're, you're still at university, okay. you, you know, you're working at Pizza Hut and things like that. So mm -hmm. for me, it was like, I'll, I'll like take your, care of it. Yeah. Kind of thing, yeah. yeah, so like for me, it was, I'll take care of it, you know, you come and stay with me kind of thing. So I wanted to, especially when I went back to London as well, like I wanted to show people in my area now that I've got money, mm. you know, because I think, I think with black people as well and the area I grew up in, you know, there is a status that you want to show. You want to mm -hmm. show you're wealthy. Like going back to when I went, when I started chopping down Bond Street, like I used to walk into shops and people would look at me and be like, can you afford it? It you doesn't add be, up. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't <laughs> add up. Yeah, you're some young kid. Like you shouldn't even be in this store. You know, and then I'll be like, I need two pairs of loafers, like mm -hmm. kind of thing. And that's, that's what happened, you know. So for me, it was always like, I want to show what I've got. And then having my property as well, I was like, okay, now I've got that. That's an investment, but I can still spend and yeah. you know, live the lifestyle. But I wasn't really stacking then. Mm. You know? But you felt like you wasn't at the time? Yeah, I felt like I was. I think in my mind, I was thinking, because he said to me, you know, if you buy this now, it's like, it's, it's an, you know, because I bought it off market as well. So not all of them were actually finished. Okay. So I think I got it for even cheaper. I think I got it for like 330, but they were getting sold for like, Maybe three fifty, something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You still got that? No, I sold, sold that. Yeah. Sold, it. sold that, yeah. yeah. Cool. And then as well, when we're talking about black people as well, which I think is actually really common, is you know, when you start making money, did you find how 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 was how did it work in terms of like your parents? Was you was you helping them out money wise as well? Yeah, so like I would give them my mum money and give my dad money and like if they said to me that, you know, I wanna go on holiday, I'd sort that out. But my parents were never like you know, I even said to my parents at one point, you know, do you want me to get you a place? Okay. Um, but I was like, no, it's your money. You know, you've earned it. You know, kind of yeah. enjoy it kind of thing. Do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, m my parents were never like that, even though I offered, you know, they, li they live in a nice house now. They live in a townhouse in Archway. So it's not like they live in a, in a flat yeah. somewhere. And is that through them, through them as well? Yeah, so like when I, I grew up in a, f a you know, a, f a, a council townhouse. Yeah, but obviously, you know they still they still live in it to this day, and you mm -hmm. know pay their bills and and whatnot. So yeah, Cause it's interesting. I think I think when we're talking about that kind of community, I think one of the biggest expenses for a lot of players is their families. Yeah. Um. So no, it's, also, it's interesting to hear how it worked with yours. So in terms in terms of that, there wasn't much in terms of like you giving back to them. 
they're kind of no. On, I, on I looked after. Like, I looked after them. I still give them money today. You know. Okay. They're they're comfortable. But, but they were never like reliant on. No, they was never it. reliant on me. Okay. And I know that there's you know there's some footballers parents that yeah. are reliant on them. So yours were like gifts rather yeah, than. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Was, you're like even now, like if you know Christmas and things like that, you know I get them something nice. I'm like, why do you get me this kind of mm. you know? So they're very humble people and. Yeah, you know, I, I love them to death. Yeah, so obviously mo- mo- moving up through the ranks, you're making more. You're making more. Yeah. Did you then start getting any other business adventures? Did you start getting other people around you that giving you advice? Yeah, I mean, if, start looking? in football, you know, I'm sure you know. I know you're a bit younger than me, but like, there's people that say, "No, oh, invest in this, invest in that." And was that was that quite common even even back then? Just like loads of people coming to footballers. Yeah, so there was, was there was loads with, of things. That, I mean, there's big problems. I'm, I'm you know, it was in the media. And, you know, invest in this movie, invest in that, it's mm-hmm. tax write-offs and all that kind of thing. And, you know, you do. And then it turns out to be just some scheme and you end up losing your money. So yeah. I did that a few times. And, you know, you got stu- I got stung. Um, but, I, yeah, property was always, like, the one where, you know, you trust it. Yeah, you felt safe. You know, I felt safe doing it, you know, even though it might be a big outlay at the time and, you know, maybe it can stretch your pocket each month, mm-hmm. but at least you knew that, at least I knew that I was living in it or I owned it yeah. and I could rent it out or I could sell it, mm-hmm. you know, so it was an investment. So with that, when you, the times you got stung, if you could do things differently, what, what would you do? What, what were the reasons why you got stung? Was Just it like, it was cowboys. It was cowboys. So like, you know, I invested in some, a project one time and it was like, I don't know, sixty thousand or sixty thousand dollars or something like that into some oil thing, and it turned out to be some stupidness. And then yeah. there was some movie thing where you could like, oh, I heard about, I've heard about it, this. Yeah, yeah. And, you know things like that, and it was just, you know, you get stuck. How, how, how did these opportunities get brought to you? Just you really get, like, outside. Yeah, you get introduced. Sources. You get introduced and that outside sources. Mm. You know, you meet people okay. and they say, "Oh, you should speak to this person." And you know, there are some things that um, could have could have paid off that I didn't do. And then there was other things that I did do that didn't yeah. pay off. But, you know, you only remember the ones that didn't pay off because you get stung. Yeah, of course. You know, and then me being from where I'm from, you you know, you feel like you're being robbed now. So now it's like, you feel like that can't happen to me, man. Yeah. I need to get it back kind of thing. You know, so it, mm. it kind of get, you know, it can get me into trouble and, yeah. But I mean they're the they're cowboys, there's loads of cowboys. Yeah. When you're when you're a successful person, you know, then then people seem to be around you more. Yeah. And if you don't have the guidance and the knowledge and people that you know around you that can actually look after you and your best interests honestly, you know, you're gonna get stung. I think most footballers, especially back then, would have got stung. Mm. You know, did get stung. Um but I guess that was just a life back then. I really hope you're enjoying the show. I would just like to ask for one minute of your time to tell you about my sponsor whose support makes the show possible, CPC Finance. CPC Finance is a finance broker that specializes in sourcing and packaging a wide range of property funding. You name it, from buy to let to commercial properties, auction investments, property developments. They are everything you'd want as a finance broker working for you on your property deal. They're extremely experienced. They know their market extremely well, which means they can move quickly. They're on the ball. They've been in the game for 30 years, which has enabled them to, one, build very strong relationships with a variety of lenders, which as an investor is super important, especially when things don't go to plan. Deals in certain situations aren't straightforward, which is often the case. They are bespoke specialists. And two, they have a brilliant understanding of all types of property investing. They know the strategies, they understand deal structures. There isn't anything these guys haven't seen, you know, they're seasoned pros. So if you're someone looking for property finance of any kind, go to cpcfinance.co.uk and on the homepage, you can schedule in a call at whatever time or day suits. How, how do you think you could avoid that now? I think nowadays, I think it's easier. I think there's, you know, Football clubs, I think, um, try and put... I, I know there's some football clubs, not all at the moment, but I know there's some football clubs that, you know, kind of give advice and introduce you to the right people. And I think if yeah. a football club's introducing you to the right people, then yeah. generally it's going to be the right person. Otherwise, the football clubs will get in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that happens now. Um, but I think back back then, one big difference, I would say, between football back then and now is that you really had to play well and do well to get money, to get a contract. Whereas now, 
if you're British and you're potentially good, you get paid yeah. based upon your potential. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, people can lose that hunger quickly. I think my generation, you know, I love watching football now and I love being involved in football. And, I, you know, I think the players are, are, are really good, but I think the hunger of the players back then was much more than it is now because... You think that like, that's down to yeah, you money? Earning, you're like, yeah, because you're earning, you can earn life-changing money at 16 years old. Yeah. You know, there's players that I've heard are on like seven, ten thousand a week. Mm. And, you know, yeah, it's true, for yeah. some players, for some people, if you manage that ten thousand a week, right, that can be life changing money. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, if definitely. you invest it right, that is life changing money for certain people. Yeah. You know, if you're not burning the candle at both ends. Yeah. And you think obviously uh, like what you're saying, a massive drive a lot of the time for young players. Is, is money, right? So if you have that that early, you're saying that drive maybe goes... Yeah, I've heard, to, I've heard some mad stories about, you know, retired players going to speak to like 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds at clubs and then, you know, they're asking questions like, does football have to be your main priority? You know, things like that. And you think, what kind of question is that? <laughs> you know, if, if football's not your main priority, what is, you know? And obviously, it's money. Mm. You know, for me, back in the day, it was, of course I wanted nice trainers, and I, I know what I see, what I wanted, and I knew it was more than I could afford and my parents could afford. Yeah. But my my real love was football still. Of course. You know, I wasn't doing football to earn money. I was doing it because I love it. And then the, the advice my dad gave me, you know, wealth will follow, you know, was, was yeah. what dr drove me. Yeah. Um, now I, I think pe people don't have that drive and I think you get money, you know, too early, um, which I... You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day, actually. I think, you know, if you're earning 10 grand a week, I think clubs now should, you know, they shouldn't give you all of it. They should, you know, maybe invest it for mm. you or put it somewhere where you can't get it until you're a certain age. And you can only get it if you invest in a property or something like that. Right. But giving you your whole salary, that can mess your career up, man. Like yeah. I've seen it, you know, you see Balotelli. You know, if you give, I mean, I heard that Balotelli was earning like five, six grand a week at Inter Milan. And then, you know, he went to... Man City and he's earning like 50, 60 grand a yeah. week. That will mess up anyone's mentality. Yeah. That can send anyone's, you know, anyone off the rails. Yeah. Fully, I just get, get the feeling that the club's like, just feel like it's just not, not our, respons our responsibility. Yeah, especially back in my day. That's the thing. Yeah. It wasn't like that. It wasn't like, that's, that's you. Mm. You know, you got to deal with that. You got to find the right people. For us, it's like, you know, we just care about your performances on the pitch. You know. Do you think that will ever change? Yeah, I think it will. I think it is changing. You know, Clubs are, you know, trying to find the right people to introduce to their players and maybe, maybe you know, educate them yeah, I'm not, I, I haven't seen how to manage now. their finances. Yeah. I think it's the bigger clubs, the one, you know, the clubs that I'm not going to mention, but yeah. the clubs that I've heard of are the bigger clubs where they, you know, try and give financial advice to the younger players. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I've been at, what, I'd say there's one time um, that I've had someone a club is a, obviously a big club as well. That's come in when I was maybe like when I was younger. Well, I've had one experience of like someone coming in, a finance guy coming in, yeah. and um, you know talking about finances, and it was just like your normal, just stocks and shares, giving yeah. giving money over them to manage for you. Yeah. But other than that, I've not not heard of many, um, yeah. and not heard of many from. I, do you know? I don't even think it's, it's their responsibility either. I'm not saying oh they should be doing this because I don't think it is. I think it's like it's got to be the players, isn't it? They're, at the end of the day, it's a business for them, isn't it? They can't. Yeah but, think, like if, yeah, but I think if you, if a club was to manage your money and make you understand how to manage your money going forward, I think that would cause less stresses for a player, which ultimately yeah, will help them point. perform on the pitch. Because yeah. I knew, I know gamblers that was like gambling stupid money mm -hmm. that they didn't have, um, and then it just affected them on the pitch. And then I know gamblers that gambled what they could afford, that wasn't bothered about. It. I think if you're going to be a gambler. You know, at least gamble what you yeah. can afford to lose rather than, you know, your house or, yeah. you know, what you ain't got. But then you might have the, the clued up guys that are only getting half their money and the club's keeping the other half and they're thinking, no, like, give me, I'm cool, like, give me the rest of my money. Yeah, but I think then that's a choice that I still, I still, listen, it's a choice. I'm just putting it out there. I don't know how you, they would do it, but yeah, I just yeah, think no, that you. if you're, if you're going to give like a player a hundred grand a week when he was like 20 years old and then, yeah, it could definitely be looked at case by case, isn't it? Yeah, okay. case by yeah, case, yeah. But I think when, when you hear about these people that was earning big money and then they go broke, it's because they was, 
spending more than they had. Mm. You know, and they had. So was you was you always wary of that? No, no. In my younger years, I wasn't. No, so you I was like really living spending. in the moment. Yeah, I was living in the moment. Yeah. I was just spending my money. I was going out. Like I, I, said, I wasn't. I wasn't a big drinker, but I would go and spend like a few grand a weekend. Yeah. You know. Were you on what <laughs> water? Just, alcohol for my friends to enjoy. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, you t- to go out in London to get a table, you need to buy alcohol. Yeah, right? yeah. And I'm okay, not standing cool. at the bar queuing up, so I would get the <laughs> table, but you have to buy the alcohol, and then you know my friends will. Okay. My my friends will drink it kind of mm. thing. For me, I was like. You know the soft drinks. I I didn't really yeah. drink that much. Even now, I don't drink beer. I just, you know I drink red wine and mm-hmm. yeah. And then um, all right. So of course, so you're living in the moment for quite a while. For, for are you at what point did you start thinking about like longevity and yeah, yeah, yeah to kind of start changing your habits? Yeah, like my my, my mid twenties, so I I bought a house in Solihull, um, off Emil Heskey. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> and then, and then <laughs> you get a good deal. What? He gave me a little. He gave, he? <laughs> he gave me. I don't know. I think he gave me. No, he gave me a little bit of a discount because okay. he just he just refurbished it and then he got his move. Yeah. He got his move and then you know I bought it off him so he didn't even really live in it that long to be honest. Um. So I bought that and then again it was a property. Mm-hmm. Um. And then kept that and so for me this I was re- always to live in as well. This one as well. Yeah. This is to live in as well. Um. So I was always kind of buying properties, keeping it and then okay. and then selling it. But in hindsight, I wish I had, you know, just kept a few and just rented yeah. them out, you know, because then I would have seen more growth and in the future. Yeah. I would what was your mindset at the time? Why was you selling them? Because it was, you know, he always said that, remember this guy that gave yeah. me the advice, he was like, wherever you go. Oh, and you was leaving and then selling them. Yes, yeah, so I was left. leaving, okay. selling them and then getting another one. Yeah. Rather than, and I'd make money on them, but it wasn't like, you know, I'd make like maybe 30, 40, 50 grand, depends on if you refurbish and, yeah. and do things like that. But I was never making like the hundreds mm-hmm. because I was just keeping it for like two, three years yeah. and then selling it. And, and obviously, then, you wasn't you renting, know. so you wasn't, you didn't have another stream of income outside of football. It was all football. Yeah. So this is this when like you know until I was, until I really hit my like until I got to Cardiff, I didn't really start thinking about okay, you know, because now I'm in my mid twenties and I'm thinking now you're injury away from yeah, you know, if you if I have to retire today, what you know, what, what have I got kind of thing. Mm. So that's when I started thinking about in investing and saving my money and taking care of things. So now I wasn't, you know, going on holidays, you know, spending like so you started 10, you, you started thinking about it now. for like a, a ten day holiday. Yeah. Now I'm start I started thinking about it, and you know I still used to go on a nice holiday, but it wouldn't be two or three holidays. Mm-hmm. It'd be one nice one, you know, one in Europe. My wife's Italian, so we go and stay with her parents. She's got a nice place in Verona. Um, and you know, m- my lifestyle changed. Yeah. Well, and wh- how how was that? Was that all right in terms of like you know, you obviously were showing your friends a good time a lot of the times. Yeah. And you probably had to pull back on that a bit. Yeah. No. I definitely was there any did. resistance on that at all? Was that no, I did. I definitely pulled back. Like my friends would co- still come and stay with me. Like when I was in Cardiff and mm-hmm. when I when I lived here in, in in Manchester, my friends would always come with me wherever. But we just wouldn't go out as much. So like when when I was living in Manchester, I got an injury and I was out for a few months. All of a sudden, now I'm thinking, well, I can go out all the time now. Mm-hmm. So they was up with me, and you know, we'd go out like Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Yeah, a lot of the time. But then as I got older, I kind of you kind of get bored of it because you yeah, feel yeah, like definitely. I feel like now I've been there and done it. You know, I don't want to go out all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, things changed. Yeah, and. Way. And then, um, so from then, was it was it ever a worry for you, like in the career and finances, or was it just like you were just aware of it? No, it wasn't a worry at that point. You know, because before I went to Cardiff, I was I was having a really bad time at Wolves um, because I didn't get on with the manager. Okay. I mean, I don't even know exactly what happened, but we just fell out, mm-hmm. and you know, he was trying to sell me, and I was, you know, he was trying to get whatever he could for me, and you know, there was some like. He was trying to pawn me off to like League One, League Two clubs, and I was like, "I'm not going there. Oh, if I'm going to leave, I'll leave on my own terms." Mm-hmm. But then he was like, trying to make things re- really uncomfortable for me, so right. he like make me train in the out. afternoon by myself, um, take bring me in in the morning. Yeah. Did you have a better attitude at this point? My attitude wasn't perfect, but it was better than it was when okay. I was younger. Because now I'm not aggressive. Now I know that I can't, yeah. you know, fight on the training field and, <laughs> you know, do do the things that I would probably do when I was younger. 
Um, but then I remember Gary Breen. So I used to go in training with Gary Breen. And he said to me, listen, you know, you've got no future at this club. He said, but what you need to do is you need to get your mind right and just say, OK, yeah, I'm training in the afternoon with a fitness coach, but you're training now to get yourself in good condition for when you go to your next club. Mm -hmm. He said, so as much as, you know, it might piss you off, just get on with it and smile because mm -hmm. that's the only thing that is going to keep your mind at peace. So then one morning, obviously, I was driving to, I was driving to training at Wolves uh, and I get a phone call off a private number. You know, these managers, when they call you, it's always a private number. And he's like, it's Dave Jones. And at the time I was thinking, Dave Jones, man, that's that guy off Sky Sports, isn't it? <laughs> and then uh, he says, no, nah, no, nah, it's Cardiff manager. And uh, he's like, listen, I've got permission to talk to you. Uh, turn your car around and, and get yourself down to Cardiff. Okay. So I literally like, yeah, went yeah. Away and I literally turned off, put in navigation, like, you know, the address. Yeah. And, you know, I, I went down to Cardiff and I remember on the way down and I spoke to my agent. I was like, listen, you know, this is an opportunity now. And I need to make myself indispensable to this club mm -hmm. and that's when my attitude changed and you know I've, I had my mind 100% focused on football now yeah yeah and then um how did you feel then a lot better yeah like performance wise yeah like my wife was you know uh, very instrumental um to me I remember you know my agent came to my house you know as I was signing for, for Cardiff and he spoke to me, he said, listen, for the ability you have, you're really underachieving. He said, yeah, you've got a nice house and you've got nice cars. Where was you at the minute? What, le what league was you in? I'm in the championship. Okay. Yeah, so I'm in the championship with Wolves. Um, and this is like, as I'm transitioning now. So now I'm like, with my agents discussed in terms of Cardiff and he came to me and he said, listen, for your ability, you're massively underachieving. Like there's players with half your ability. Yeah. But they're earning big money in the premiership. He said, so you really need to, you know, knuckle down and focus and, you know, train hard every day. Um, and to be fair, Dave Jones gave me that platform. He says to me, listen, you can you can do whatever you want from Monday to Wednesday, but, you know, you perform on Saturday. I don't care about Monday to Wednesday. Mm. Um, but, you know, I was really focused on doing well because I, yeah. I didn't want to be one of them footballers that, would be like, ah, oh, he, he, he could have been good or, you know, yeah. my, my career. Did you been, feel like you was underachieving as well? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like my career has been very much up and down. And in terms of like my career, nobody can talk to me about my career because I achieved everything I wanted to achieve mm -hmm. from my get go. The only thing that I was saying now I know this is that if I had, I had my mind right from the beginning, I could have had, I could achieve more, you know, at high heights. Okay. You know, playing for Arsenal regularly because I had that ability, you know, yeah. even, you know, when I got called up to England, even Arsene Wenger said that, you know, a lot of people said that, but, you know, my career was very much up and down. And even when I look back at it now, you know, I achieved everything I wanted to achieve. I played in the Premier League. I played in, you know, Serie A in Europe, which I wanted to. I played in a European competition, which I yeah. wanted to. You know, I won in the Toto Cup, which mm -hmm. was, you know, it was, a, it was a decent thing back then. Um, you know, I guess it was a, your equivalent of like the Europa Conference League, something like that. Yeah. Um, and I played for my country. Yeah. And, you know, I, I earned good money. So for me, I achieved everything that I wanted to achieve. But again, my regret is that if my attitude was right when I was younger, I could have done more. Yeah. Does that hurt or not? It doesn't hurt, but I just know that I could have done more. Yeah. And I think the reason why it doesn't hurt is because, again, I, I achieved everything that I wanted to achieve. Yeah. Um, and I got to retire on my terms. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't I didn't get retired because I couldn't find a club or, you know, through injury. Yeah. You know, I got to retire on my terms. That's why like, I'm at peace. I'm happy. You know, I'm here today. I, but, I don't yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm not stressed. You yeah. Know? So I think that that was really good for me. Mm. So you was, at, you was at Cardiff at this point. You was in the champ. Had yeah. you played in the Premier League yet before that? Yeah, so I played in the Premier League at, at Coventry. At Cov, okay. But then so they, they, they went through financial problems. And so I went, when I was at Coventry, the first season was cool. We, we, we stayed up and then the sec I think it was the second season we went down. And then they got financial problems. They sat Gorner Strachan, who I think was like amazing manager. I wish he had stayed because he was so good for the young players. Yeah. And because he, he was a player himself, he, he, he really... 
We really got, actually, I don't know, I can't even remember it was the first season we got relegated, but I remember that, it, you know, I was happy there with him. Mm -hmm. um, and then the club started going down and the reason why I went to Italy, because they asked me to take a pay cut. And at the time I was like, I was having a, a child with, you know, my girlfriend at the time. And I was like, I can't afford a pay cut, man. I've got a baby coming now. Yeah. Like, and they was like, well, you know, it's something we need to talk about. And then I was like, listen, because I've got this confidence. So I was yeah, like, listen, yeah, yeah. give me a free transfer. You won't need me on your books no more. Yeah. I'll go and get another club. Uh -huh. like, so, they, so they came back to me a few days later and was like, all right, then we'll, we'll give you a free transfer. So that's when I went to Italy, you know, and I, I loved that move to Italy. It was, it, it was amazing, man. Was it like living there? It was amazing. Like so. living, you know, I used to live in Umbria, Perugia, you know, Florence was... Can you speak Italian now? Yeah, I can get by. I okay. can get by. You know, I sh I, it, if I was there longer, I could polish up and, and speak yeah, yeah, it. Yeah. Like, at the time, I could speak it pretty well, to be honest. But, you know, being in England, even though my wife's Italian, you know, she's not, you know, second generation Italian. She's Italian. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I can get by when my wife speaks to her sister and parents. You know, mm. I understand. Um. So at, at that point when you was like went to Cardiff, you felt like you was underachieving. Yeah. Did you end up getting back to it? Yeah. So that's when I got my England call up. Oh, it was from there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the first season I remember. And what changed? What got what got there? You think changing attitude? Changing attitude. That was it. Was that and was yeah, that so like working harder? Yeah, it's just working harder, being focused, recovery, not going like not going out shopping, yeah. not going out afterwards, not going out in midweek. It was just like fully focused. Like watch my games back, mm -hmm. see where I can be better. Watch other football you know, take bits from other players. Yeah. You know, football's the only, I think football's one of them only careers where you can get free knowledge. As in, you can turn on the TV and learn from someone. Uh -huh. You know, you don't have to go into class. You don't have to do nothing. You just turn on the TV and you can look at someone and say, you know what? I want to put that in my game. I want to practice yeah. this. I want to practice that. And you can see, if you really apply yourself, you, you can get better at something. You know, everyone has their limitations, but for me, my limitations were higher than others. Mm -hmm. So I would really look back on my games and then watch a lot of football, look at players that played like similar to me and try and emulate the good things that they did in their game and put it into my game. Um, so that's how I got going at Cardiff. But I remember my first game at Cardiff, he, he, I was on the bench and I was like, oh God. Why am I on the bench, man? I'm training hard and you know, now I'm on the bench, just like what's going on? And it was no disrespect to the other players, but I just thought, I'm I'm better than this player. Like, yeah. why is he playing in front of me? Yeah. And he just said, Listen, I want to ease you in. And at the time they had a, a coach there called Terry Burton who had like who who was with Arsenal before. So the whole way they played suited me. Whereas at Wolves it was like a target man. Mm. You know, Mick, Mick McCarthy had me as a target man, you know flick ons and knockdowns and yeah you know hold the ball up get back in the box and that old-fashioned style that just wasn't me you know i got i learned my trade through arsene wenger which was like you know pass and move we did training sessions where you can't pass the ball over knee height <laughs> you know now you're <laughs> well, I'm, now I'm like, if it goes over he's blowing the whistle yeah blowing the whistle it's the <laughs> other team's ball now um so when i went to cardiff it it was very much the style that suited me, which was pass and move, you know, he said to me, you can you can go wherever you want. You can flirt around the pitch, get involved, you know, influence the game in any way you want, but make sure you get yourself back into the box mm. to finish those chances. And from when he said that, I was like, perfect, man. That's just my game, man. Yeah. I love that. Because I'm not one of them. And then play. Goals to more goals started coming from there. Yeah, the first season, I think I scored 13. Okay. And we finished, I think we finished like eight or something like that. But at the time, I remember feeling like I'm enjoying my football now. Yeah. You know? I, I'm not one you of always them remember them that time. Innit? Yeah, so I, I'm not one of them footballers or forwards that are happy to like touch a ball like eight, ten times, yeah. get a goal and go home happy. Yeah. For me, I need to be touching the ball like 30, 40 times, mm. be involved in the game. You know, I was even happy to get in a as long as I made a contribution to my team, I'd go home happy. We got yeah. three points. You know, I, I wasn't, I was never gonna be one of them strikers that was top goal scorer. For me, I was happy to score like, you know, 10, 15 goals, but they get 10 assists or something like that. Mm. For me, that was my game because I grew up watching like Dennis Bergkamp. Yeah, yeah. You know, people like that. He didn't live and die by goals. He's, he had more of an all-round game. Mm -hmm. Even Henri was there. 
I think one of his seasons he scored like 20 goals and got 20 assists, something yeah. ridiculous. So for me, assists was always as important as goals. Um, so I didn't need to score a goal to have a good game. I just wanted to influence the game. Um, and again, Dave Jones gave me that platform to play how I wanted to play. Mm. And I think after the first year, he started giving me pieces that could help my game. You know, yeah. he started kind of building the team around, not, I wouldn't say primarily around me, but he's, he's the players that he in. brought in benefited me, which was, which was really good. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. And then, so going back to like, more of like the financial kind of side of it, you get, you're, you're getting older, you're getting to like late 20s, mm. early 30s, right? So now I got my move to QPR. Okay. So that was the most money I ever earned. That was like life changing money. What age? So, I think I would have been like 28. Yeah, okay. It's something like, I think I was 28, 27, 28. Yeah, um, and where, where, where was that there? Did you have any other business of, business ventures or would you just like buying properties? Yeah, just Anything buying else? properties, get involved in properties. Um, did you have, a, did you have a, savings, you know, like ISAs and okay. you know, things like that I was, I was doing and, you know, I was trying to save. And then, but when I got my, my, um, QPR contract. I mean, in hindsight, it was it was nice being at QPR, but I know this is primarily about finance. But obviously, me being yeah, a footballer, I have yeah, to yeah, talk about it. But I had options to leave. I, I didn't want to. I didn't ever want to leave Cardiff because mm. I love the club. I love the city. I love my teammates. You know, everything was perfect for me there. But we didn't get promotion, and I think the worst thing that happened and the best thing that happened was me playing for England. Because now I got a taste of, and I got to see these players like Gerard, Rio, you know, all these England players. And I could see that. With you my you got that when you was at Cardiff? Yeah, in the in championship. The yeah. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Did you play for England while you were in the champ? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. So like now I've I gone to play that. for England and I'm training with these Premier League players. And I'm like, okay. I don't feel like a place here. Like, there's players that I'm looking at. Oh, that's at rare, no? Is that, yeah. that ever happened? That, it's, that ever, it's happened a few times. Know, I think my missus asked me that the other day. She was like, has anyone ever been called up from the champ? I was like, no, nah, that don't happen. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it doesn't happen often, but again. Can you like, remember I anyone was, else? Yeah, so I was, I think there's a few, I think did, uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe David Nugent, maybe. Okay. I think maybe yeah, him. Rare. But was you, how, how did you feel when that came out? Was that just like, out of the blue, or did you get any warning? No, it, it, it was weird because I remember. Or was people asking? I played a game. I played a game and I scored and I done really well. And Dave Jones was had an interview after the game, and he said something along the lines of, "This guy's good enough to play for England." Mm. And then that little seed that he planted, yeah, it started growing. <laughs> and then, and then before I knew it, because this is in my final season of my contract now, right? And I remember the season before, so in my second season, I went to the club and I said. I want a new contract. And it was like, no, no, you got, you know, you've got a year left. Let's talk about it, you know, next year. And I was, I was like, I was annoyed about that because now I'm like playing regularly. You don't want to give me a new deal. Mm. Why not? Um, and I know Cardiff did have some financial problems at, at that point, you know, with Peter Ridsdale there, but I still felt that, you know, they brought on, they brought in other players on loan, like Michael Chopper. And I know that he was on like, I don't know, 15 grand a week or something like that. So if you're if you're able to pay some of his wages or even half, you know, and you're talking about signing him the season after, then you're going to take over his wages at some point. Yeah. I need some of that, <laughs> you know, and they didn't give me that. And I was upset yeah, about th that. This is your, your agents going and talking like this, right? It's not. Yeah, it's not me. It's not, my okay, agent. Cool. Yeah. So I was like, I need some of that. And then, you know, they was like, no, nah, we're not giving it to you. So now I'm in my last year of my contract. I started off really well i'm like i think i scored like i don't know f maybe 15 goals by christmas okay so my, but my call up came in like i think it was november october november but yeah now i'm like getting called up by the england team so i'm going to play with england players and i'm like man, yeah man i can i can play at this level okay and then Oh, that, that, so you so you had that you had good confidence you didn't go there thinking like no I'm I went a bit there, like yeah, imposter no, no, syndrome no, no. on like, I went, you're in the no, champ no. I went there feeling yeah, like yeah, yeah, I nah. need to prove myself I need to show these man that I can play and it's yeah. like Did, what, what strikers are there at the minute so when you went up I mean I was a little bit fortunate like Rooney was injured and but at the time there was still like Carlton Cole was there um, Peter Crouch was there Andy Carroll got you know called up because he had an amazing season at Newcastle um, so. 
you know, Milner was there, Ashley Young was there, Gerard was there, Rio was there, like I think Mika Richards was there. Like they, it was a good, it was still yeah. a good team. You know, it's Wembley, it was France at Wembley. Like it, it was just like amazing. But I remember when I came back, I was like, okay, if I'm gonna play for England going forward. It's not gonna happen if I stay in the championship now. Of course. You know, now I've got that kind of I've got a taste for it. Yeah. Unless Cov I mean, unless Cardiff get promoted, whether I like it or not, I've got aspirations. I need to either go up with them and play, or if they don't go up, I need to move. Mm. Yeah. Now I'm on a free transfer at the end of the season. Um and obviously we didn't go up, but I remember at Christmas time the thing that really upset me at Cardiff, and it wasn't it wasn't the manager or the player, the thing that really upset me is that when they got taken over by, you know, the Asian the Asian company, um they employed some guy that did was dealing with the contracts and he said to me, if you, he kind of gave me an ultimatum, which I didn't like. Right. You know, he just came in the door. Yeah. And for me it was like, I don't really want to talk about contracts now. I just want to focus on getting promotion. And he kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me. And I remember like Newcastle phoned me up, Alan Pardew phoned me up saying, you know, we'll give you a free year deal now. We're prepared to pay for you. You know, will you come? And everyone was interested in me. And at the time I was just like, no, nah, I want to stay. I want to try and get promotion with Cardiff. And this guy is trying to sell me. And he was like, listen, if you don't sign a new deal now, you know, we're gonna we're gonna you know offer offer you around and I yeah. didn't like that I didn't like that that really put me off because I was like after you know me giving my services me playing well you're basically trying to sell me at Christmas time you know so you're basically saying you know you're trying to sell your one of your best players which is gonna ultimately hinder the club um, and I didn't like that so he's kind of pushing me and that that rubbed me up the wrong way and yeah. then we didn't get promotion and. Then he had tried to offer me a new deal at the end of the season. I was like, I'm not interested because of the way you treated me. Mm. Um, but also because I, I just had Premier League aspirations. And then I signed with QPR. QPR is a great club. They're in the Prem? Yeah, they're in the Prem now because they got promoted from the champ. Yeah. It was it was, it was was a great deal financially. Um, but it's difficult. It was really difficult because... You're back in London as well now, aren't it? Yeah, but I'm back in London, but that, I was not, at this point. Yeah, I'm matured just now. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm matured now. So I wasn't, I was going out still, but I wasn't going out anywhere near as much. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't, you know, spending like, I was spending money, but not like crazy money. It's money mm -hmm. that I could afford now. Yeah. Um. And did you, I, did you dip in, in wages? Ever. When you was like, yeah, when you was like Cardiff, for example. No, that's, a, I was having this conversation with someone the other day, actually. Yeah. I would say, I never dipped in wages. Okay. Like, I've always like, I've, yeah, yeah, I've gone. I've stayed at the same wage and then I've gone up. Okay, and, or I've you know that kind of way. Yeah, I've not, you know, gone up and then gone down mm -hmm. and then gone back up. Yeah, I've always maintained. Okay. Um, but then I went to to QPR and I always say it's it's really difficult for a striker to have a a good season when you get promoted because you're not you ain't got the ball no more. Now you're like yeah, behind yeah, the yeah, ball. And you see it, look at Mitrovic, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's gone crazy. But then yeah. when he, when he went to the Premier League, when he goes to the Premier League, he's going to be different for mm -hmm. him. Unless they really invest, it's going to be hard for him. Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. And that's because you know you're behind the ball, and when you do to get the ball, it you might be that. that long ball when you got to hold it, yeah. and then you got to wait for your team to come up. Or you're you in might... your own half and you're winning it. And yeah, you're exactly. Like hundred yards on the goal. And, yeah, a hundred percent. And then you know where you'd get like maybe. Two, two, three chances in a game in the championship, you know, because mm -hmm. we want one of the best teams. Now you're not even getting a chance every weekend. Yeah. You know, so it was, it was hard. And I would always say, you know, midfielders and defenders, you can influence a game because you can make tackles. Course, you can yeah, go back, yeah. you can get the ball. Definitely. Whereas in, strikers have to rely on service. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're not having them chances, then it's difficult for you to score. And when you do get them chances, if you don't score, then it's like, oh, he's, you know, He's missing yeah. chances kind of thing. Uh, but again, financially, it was it was really good. And again, I, I, then I, I bought a place and it was the first time I did... In London? Well, it was Hertfordshire. Okay. Yeah, and it was the first time I did like a renovation where I bought 
I bought a house, knocked it down and renovated it. I mean, you, you just got a team together to do that? Yeah, yeah. I just I, At the time, I just I used a, a building company that I knew through my agent. Um, so mm -hmm. at the time, it was like Jermaine Defoe lived on the same road and, and my agent lived on the same road. And he said, like, the houses on this road are really good. And if you buy it, you know, he's, he always said to me, if you buy a shit house on a good road, uh -huh. You know, you can always make money. By the by, the worst house on the, on the, the best, best road. Street. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that that's what I did. Well, it's not the best street, but it's one of the best yeah, streets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it had potential. So we did. Did you have that. a portfolio at this point, or was you always just selling them still? Yeah. So I was like buying and selling. Okay. So and because I was making and just money, sitting and just sitting on cash. Yeah. Okay. Or like you know, put it in savings and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. I had I had I had I had one apartment that I kept. That I bought um, in in North London, and and I kept that for a bit, but it was more that was more like just a flip as well. So I was mm -hmm. just like, I just, I, I always wanted to. I don't know why, but I always felt like I wanted to be money ready, because for like an opportunity. Lot, yeah, I I always want if the opportunity comes to me, I always want to be a position where I can do it. Yeah, if I like it, um, and I've missed a few like that. Like I remember I, I had. Uh, I mean, it's not it's not really a, a safe investment, but I remember my friend came to me and was like, man, you should invest in crypto. Okay. Recently or? This is when I was at QPR. So this is like 2000. Oh, oh, my guy was early. On yeah. So this is like 2000. What was this? This must have been about Ooh. like 2000, I don't know, 12 or something like right, that. Okay. So this is at the beginning. And he said yeah. to me like, you know, buy some Bitcoin at like, it's like $500. And bearing in mind, this is the most money I've ever earned. Uh -huh. And he said to me, invest like 500 pound and get bitcoin and i'm i'm there going you know i'm buying now i'm buying clothes for like 500 pound a t-shirt yeah and and i was like no nah, i don't i'm not really into it and i mean in hindsight now you know i mean now it's yeah dipped, man. but i mean he might did he pester you about that yeah he said to me a few <laughs> times and i was just like no nah, man i'm not interested in the yeah. tech you probably thing. don't regret like you, don't, you weren't interested in but it. i think i think the reason why i didn't more than anything is because he was my friend Mm. So I don't like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't like mixing my friendship with yeah, money because you know if I if I lose money, I'm gonna lose my friendship as well. Yeah, yeah, that. And then because of the other things that I got involved with when I was younger, I was like, I don't really wanna, I don't really wanna do this because I might get stung. I, I was mm -hmm. kind of more like I need to invest in things that I know, like yeah. an asset. Was you was you thinking security. beyond football now? Yeah, now I'm thinking beyond okay. football. Yeah, now I'm thinking beyond football. So obviously that. Property, did, you have a, did you have a plan? Yeah, I just wanted to buy properties. All right. And now and I just live off the income from the properties. Yeah, and I was thinking about developing. Okay. Um, you know, setting up my own construction company. Um and doing things that way cuz my wife's an interior designer and I've I've always I don't know why, but I've always had an eye for property like mm -hmm. a, a nice house you, really like, you know even now if i see a nice house same, i stop yeah. outside it and i'll be like yeah i'm the same right yeah, like that as you all know it's been a turbulent time for travel with the booking process in particular causing feelings of frustration and anxiety amongst travelers whether that's for business or for those holidaying with their families with that being said i would like to introduce you to our sponsor love to travel who are a luxury travel company specializing in tailor-made holidays for each individual client, whatever your preference might be, Love to Travel will be sure to meet your requirements. As an ambassador of Love to Travel, but also from personal experience, I'll definitely recommend them to take away all the work and stresses of booking your travel. For me, the personal service stands out. They're contactable at any time, email, over the phone, WhatsApp. They also cover a variety of holiday types, beach, ski trips, safari, sporting holidays, and also have an additional service such as private jet and yacht charters, as well as restaurant reservations. No request is too complex. All holidays are fully at all insured to ensure you can book with complete confidence. Get in contact by visiting their website, www.lovetotravel.co.uk. I couldn't care. I couldn't care about cars, watches, anything yeah, now, like that, but now I, love like, I love houses. I mean, watches, I still got some watches, yeah. but I, I don't even wear watches. They're in my safe. Mm. Um, some of them are you know, safety deposit box, but you know for house me, is different isn't it yeah okay. for houses now i stop outside them and i'm like yeah i like that finish i like that brick yeah, you know, yeah that yeah. kind of way and then i'm and then i'm i'm thinking okay for my next project i can you know maybe mm -hmm. do that and you know i read the magazines and i look at things online especially instagram now you see all these pages like the before and afters and so that's where you know I've, i'm 
you know, I'm starting that up, you know, last year and I'm, you know, I want to get things right. So it's going to be slow and I've kind of put things on hold. Yeah. Um, because it is, I think, you know, the housing market is probably going to go into a, a recession at some point. So I'm kind of just waiting because I think with properties, you have to do it right first time. Otherwise, you know, it's based on reputation, isn't it? Mm. If you get it wrong, then yeah, it's not yeah, good. good. I mean, I built, I bought my house now that I live in and, and refurbished it. Um, and you know that was it was good it was a really good experience the one I bought in Hertfordshire I bought it some guy offered me more like a few hundred grand more and I was like you know what I'm moving to Asia so okay yeah so I just sold it again yeah yeah but then when I was in when I was in Japan you know I was earning money there and you know it was tax free and it was mm. again it was just like I, I just want to keep it you know, yeah, so yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm going to be ready for opportunity. Yeah, if, if yeah, it yeah. comes about, if it comes about. Um, so for me, a lot of my investments were mainly properties. Okay. How did you get into media? Was that something you always thought about, or was it out of the blue? It, it was something that I thought about because I didn't have a burning ambition to be a coach. Yeah. Um, that, yeah, yeah. I just saying. don't. I just didn't feel. Did you ever like you done any badges at all? I'm to be fair. I'm doing my B license now, just to just to have just it. To have it yeah, 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 yeah. Again, I'll, 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 I'd rather be, I'd rather have it. Be ready for Yeah, because if one of my mates, good mates, get a job and be like, <laughs> hey, you know what, do you want to be a striker coach? Yeah, yeah, okay? yeah. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a go, but I don't have a burning ambition to, to be a coach. And I, mm -hmm. I never had that because I don't think I had, I don't have a lot of patience. Like, even now, like, I <laughs> jump Premier League games and I'm like, why is this guy kicking the ball <laughs> off the pitch? You can't <laughs> pass the ball from eight to 10 yard pass. He's kicking it off the pitch. Like, and you know, for me, that's frustrating because that's something you do every day, like in the warm ups. If you can't do it, if you do it you, every you, day in the warm up, you should be able to do it on yeah, the field. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. I understand if you're hitting like a 40 yard ball, it might go out or you might over hit it or under hit it. That's one thing. But 10 yard pass, you should be able to do that. Mm. Um, so I don't really have, I don't feel like I had the patience to be a okay. coach. So I never really looked at it. But you know, I love football. But did you look at media and have that? A desire for that yeah because I, I i like listening to people you know i remember my first my first memory of media was andy gray and richard keys and they used to do like monday night football back in the day and i always used to think they had banter and i liked it okay. they used to dissect games do the analysis and i was i even this is so this is you know this is like when i'm like 15 years old 16 years old mm -hmm. and i always liked it and enjoyed it and then as I've got older, I, you know, I always watch Match of the Day and I always like the analysis before and after games. Um, so I had, I had an eye on that. And then while I was in, in, in Japan, especially like the last few years, you know, I started speaking to um, agencies. So now 1010 um, talent agency represent me. Um, and I had some media lessons and now I'm working, you know, quite regularly on on Sky and BT Sport, Talk Sport yeah. sometimes. But did you did you um, get your agency to reach out and start finding you some media? So when I was in Japan, I, I didn't even have an agent now in Japan. I was just oh, doing right. my own contracts now. Okay. Because I was like, I know what I want. Yeah. I know yeah. I'm performing. You need to give me what I want. Yeah, who, who are you talking to? The chairman. No, I mean to get media. Oh, media. So yeah, Terry media. Ellis, um, I just, you know, I started right. speaking to Because you wanted to do media, you reached out to the to another agency. Yeah, so like I, get I got introduced, yeah, by, right. by a friend. And then, you know, we started, you know, when you, when you, when you meet someone or agent or agency, you start asking around to mm. see if they've got a, like, a good reputation. Yeah. So I, I spoke to about, you know, f four, five, six people. And they all said, yeah, he's a really good guy. You know, he, he was at Chelsea before himself. Um, so then I went for a meeting and then, you know, we sat down and I said, listen, this is my expectation. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to be going into my savings because I'm only, I'm 39. I've still got a long time to live. I don't really want to change my lifestyle that much, Yeah, yeah. but I am willing to change it. Mm -hmm. Um, and he, he told me the realistic goals, the realistic, you know, money that I could earn each month. Um, especially the, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, man, I like that. You know, for me, I lived a dream for like 23 years. You know, my life started at 39. Yeah. You know, so for me, yeah. I've, I've, I've had a good run. But now I'm like, I'm focused on, on um, doing the punditry, you know, 
Is this like a main career for you, you think? Yeah, now, yeah. So now I want to, you know, move up the ladder and keep getting better okay. at that. I'm not I'm not one of these footballers and I, I don't know, like, f- you know, I hear some things and I see some things, but I'm not one of them footballers that go on TV just to get out of the house. For me, I, I actually want to do it. I actually love football. Yeah, I love yeah, talking yeah. about it still. Uh-huh. I love, you know, analysing and, you know, having an opinion, debating. Um, and, and, you know, now things are different. So, you know, before it was like, I don't know about you, but for me, it would be like the season finishes and I'll be like, okay, Steve, I need to go on holiday next week, book it. This is where I want to go, show me the night, the hotels, I'm going. Yeah. And and I'll go, but now it's more like I need to plan yeah. because the Steve, football season. Just give Steve a shout out from yeah, yeah, Love yeah, to Travel. Love yeah. to Travel, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so he Steve, your holidays man, up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so now it's more like i got a plan because it's a football season, so I, like, yeah. I can't go away while the football season's going on and obviously I've got the school holidays now so i got to kind of plan and, and organise myself which which is new it's something different mm. yeah yeah okay cool so um, that's kind of your purpose now at the minute you want to kind of get yeah. up the ladder in terms of media yeah yeah I want to I want to improve I want to yeah. get better I want to you know every time I go on you know Sky Sports and, and BT or whatever anything I do on the media you know I always watch it back I always you know show my media coach you okay know, and you know i mean even now like i feel like i keep saying you know quite a lot and <laughs> and you know there's words yeah how, how was it like what you, you try it, you try and time? stop yeah it's a bit, you think oh it's a bit cringy yeah and you know one, there's isn't? always going to be people on your because now there's twitter and things like that. there's always going to be people oh like what are you talking about bro you, you know, could say the most basic thing ever bro, like i know football's like, played with a ball someone will say some someone will say some stupidness yeah <laughs> so i mean it's funny because you know, yeah. sometimes, sometimes I'll just have, like have some banter. Like people think that it's really hurt my feelings. It's not, but yeah, I just have yeah. some banter. Like, and you know, I say like I'm I'm really qualified. I had a t- 23 career a year career. You know, you're watching football in a pub, kind of, <laughs> you know. Um, so sometimes I have banter, but more often than not, I just you know my opinion is my opinion. Everyone's entitled yeah. to their opinion. Um, but that's probably one thing that gets criticized more than actually playing is talking about football. Yeah, talking about football. You get more criticism. Like, what, what's he on about? You yeah. know, even the other day I was on I was on Talk Sport and I was with Craig Mitch and and we was having like it was a debate, but it kind of got a bit feisty and we was like going back and forth. Hey, it, was feisty fr- on talk sport, it was wasn't it? <laughs> it was friendly. It was friendly, but we was going back and forth. Yeah. Like, what are you talking about? And we was arguing and. Like I came off and the producer said, "Yeah, it was great. That's okay. what we liked." Yeah, you know, yeah, at yeah. the time I remember coming off and I was like maybe that wasn't such a good idea, like right. going so hard and go- coming back. But then he said to me, it was really good. So no, they, like, they like that, innit? Yeah, it but then there's some fans, especially yeah. on TalkSport, there's fans that come on the Twitter afterwards and they're like, what are you talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. Mm. Why are you talking about England? You only got one cap, you're a one cap wonder. And then I'm like, boy, you know, how many people have got that one bro, cap? Do you, know, that's ma- do you know, that's so mad, yeah. And it, in, it, in football, I find it so crazy, bro. How someone will, can belittle an, an achievement like that because it's only one cap, because maybe they like compare you to a Gerard, he's played a hundred. Bro, yeah. do you know how hard it is to play that one, one cap for England? Bro? That's what I mean. That's why, that's why I just laugh at it and I say, one cap, the percentage of people since football started yeah. that but get to represent their country just once is like my new. Uh, but England small. though. England as well. This is not like, no disrespect to other countries. Yeah, it's not like course. San Marino or something. You know, I'm representing England at Wembley against France mm. under Fabio Capello. Yeah. So I think he knows his stuff here. Yeah? He's yeah. qualified. Um, yeah. And for me... Bro, I, mean, I it, realized it was yeah, the best day of my life. I realized, bro, anyone can get it. You know, people give messy criticism about his career, bro. Like from when you hear that, you, you can like, anyone's gonna get it's it. The, yeah, I mean, I, there's always debates about Ronaldo and Messi, and who are you, Ronaldo or Messi? I'm kind of caught in the, in the middle. If we're talking just like straight out and out football, a football player, Messi. Yeah, I'm. I'm for me, I'm Messi. I I, I really yeah. admire. Ronaldo but I admire Ronaldo. I, I I do admire Ronaldo more. Yeah, I admire Ronaldo, as in I admire this, Ronaldo's work ethic probably more than character. Messi. Yeah, but yeah, Messi's yeah. got that God-given talent yeah, yeah, that yeah. I just love to watch. Exactly, he's like the Roger, Roger Federer of football. It's mm-hmm. just effortless to him. Yeah. Whereas Ronaldo, you can see that yeah. he really I respect him more, but I'd I, I'd prefer to watch Messi. Yeah, hundred percent. And I'd prefer yeah. Messi on my team. But yeah, no, he no. I think that's that's interesting, man. And the media thing's really interesting as well because obviously a lot of players go into that. Yeah, but a lot of players go into it just because they got nothing to do. Yeah, yeah. Whereas that's that's what that's one thing that that's what even like a reason why I do this as well or just do whatever I'm interested in because I don't ever want to be forced into 
having to stay into something that's football, like a coach, for example. I don't, yeah. I don't want to do that. I don't ever want to feel forced into a certain role or a job just because that's all I have. Yeah. That's why I think, and I want to try and encourage like, other footballers to do, do other things that they're interested in. Because yeah. I feel like people like suppress their interest in football yeah. because they feel like they can't do it or it's not, if it's what? not golf or punditry or I mean, coaching. I love golf. I can't even lie. Yeah, I love yeah. Golf. But some people don't. That's the thing I miss, you know. From, if, you, if you say to me, what do you miss from football? The thing that I miss from football is the competition. Yeah, I don't, yeah, miss, the, I don't miss the banter because I got my friends to have banter still. Yeah, still. No, I don't miss traveling pre-season, the build-up ticket. For me, I just miss the competition. Yeah, like that you. I'm going to play against you I and I have to get the better of you. Yeah. You know, for me, that was that's what I miss. But then... Can you bring that into what you're doing though? Do you think? Media. I mean, and, we've, we, I mean, I play a lot extent. of golf, right? So like for me, golf gives me that competition. I don't okay. even need to play against someone. I'm playing against a golf course. Yeah, you know, yeah That's yeah. the score. I need to okay. try and get to that score to win. So for me, that's coming down. But yeah, with, with punditry, I think one thing about punditry that, that I would say is that on all these Sky Sports BT, they've got all the best players at the top of their field that's had the best careers, generally. And I think that's amazing. But then there's the other end of the spectrum. You know, Rio can't talk about a renegation fight because he's never been in one. Mm. Um, and these, That's a good way to look. The, yeah. yeah so for me, I'm a little bit different. I have been in a renegation fight. I have been in a championship. I have gone down and gone up. Whereas, you know, p you know them greats, and they are great, like Rio, um, Paul Scholes, you know, Carragher, Neville. Mm -hmm. They've only ever been at the top yeah. challenging for titles. That's smart, you know. You know so for me, I, the way I look at it is, I'm something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I want to try to work my way up you know, because for me, I always want to improve. I always want to get better. I've always had that mentality that, you know, if someone's doing better than me, I want to reach them. I want to aspire to that. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to get better each day at that now. Yeah, no, that's a, it's a smart way to look at it, man, because it's obviously, I was, I was actually going to ask that, like, how, how do you feel, you know, when you're doing media and you're maybe arguing with like a Rio or something? Yeah. In the back of your mind, you're always going to think the career he's had, the career he's had is obviously, he, top, he tops you, but when you come from something different, that yeah. he's not had what he's not experienced what I've experienced in this area. You yeah. bring bring what you got in it. Yeah, like so I, you know, there's there's a few people I've spoken to. You know, even I mean, I, I bumped into Jermaine Jenness the other day at the driving range, and you know, even Jermaine, I think he's had a, a fantastic career. You know, Tottenham, Newcastle. Mm -hmm. You know, he's one of those players that um, he retired because of injury, because you know he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't he couldn't function how he wanted to mm -hmm. anymore, but. I mean, look at his career. He's done like amazing. You know, he's, you know, BBC. He's, you know, is it the morning show or something like that? He's got one of their morning shows or something yeah, yeah, on, yeah. on just normal TV. He's done fantastic. He's reinvented himself. And for me, that's what I want to do. I want to reinvent myself. You know, I don't even want to be known as, you know, ex footballer anymore. I just want to yeah. be known as, you know, a pundit or a presenter mm -hmm. or, you know, something like that. Yeah, yeah. No, nice. But look, do you know, how, how long have you been retired for now? Since December. December? Yeah, so like six so months. Long. There's a question. Yeah, you've probably not been retired for for long enough for me to um to ask. But how for the, the age you're right now, you've probably seen a lot of other footballers who've been retired. Like for me, because I'm only only 28, I don't really know anyone that's retired. Yeah. I don't know how it looks after. What have you? What's your experience been like of like other players? Of what challenges I, have they faced? I think I think it depends on how they retire. Like I, I think said, that's a bit. That's a really big thing. Yeah, I think it depends on how they retire. I think there's some people that find it really hard because they're not ready to, but they have to because they can't get a club or they have an right. injury. I think those people might find it more difficult than others. Um, but like I said, I was I got to retire on my own terms, so I'm yeah. very happy for what I achieved throughout my career, knowing yeah. that there was times when I was low, there was times when. My career was like down in the dumps. Yeah. Um, I wasn't playing. I wasn't in the squad. I got my squad number taken off me. You know, I, I didn't have the best attitude. Um, but I, I got to the top. Mm. I got to represent my country. Yeah. I got to, to do things. And I think that's why I, I can look back at my career and, and, and be satisfied. Yeah. And, you know, now I'm in retirement. I don't know. It's just, you know, six months. But yeah, I, I feel content. Yeah, I think I think that's obviously how you retire. Is quite, how you retire is quite short term. But what about what have you seen from maybe people that have been retired for like five years? Yeah, so I always ask. I always ask. Yeah. 
you know, when I go and see like ex players and I go and do like podcasts and I've gone on television, I always say like, how was retirement for you? Mm. And when you first retired, some people say, you know, it was really hard. You know, I was sitting at home, I was down in the dumps, I didn't know what to do. And then this happened and okay. it inspired them. You know, I haven't- they find, they find a purpose again. Yeah, they find a purpose again. Like I haven't, I haven't really spoken. I mean, there is going to be players out there that are finding it tough even now. Um, like, like Mark Noble's just retired right from West Ham, and I'm like, well, he's, he's, when I've seen him play, he still played well, but yeah. it's the right time for him. So, I'm I'm guessing that he's going to be satisfied with what he's achieved, yeah, and he's going to come away from it and be happy. Mm. But then there's other people that might not be satisfied that can come away from it and be down in the dumps and it will really affect them mentally. And, you know, of course, in this day and age, you know, mental health is, is a big thing now. I mean, I was even having this conversation not too long ago. And, you know, if you if you spoke about mental health when I was starting out, they just say you're mentally weak, man. You're not ready for this. Yeah, team. yeah, yeah. You know, it's different now. You've got that support. There's a, there's a you know, it's easier for you to go and speak to someone. The clubs will have that there for you. Even the way I left, you know, I left in, I don't know if you know how I left, but, you know, I, I dashed my shirt, you know, I didn't dash it at him, well, <laughs> but the shirt hit me in the face, I got <laughs> sold, you know. Um, but I think nowadays, if I was to do the same thing, I think they would have handled it differently. I think they yeah. were sending me to anger management. I think they would manage right. me and, you know, see that I wasn't productive in my environment and it, I, I did have a different upbringing because I think nowadays you have to, manage people in a different way everyone's got a different personality everyone's got something yeah. different going on in their mind that you don't know about mm -hmm. like you know god bless his soul like gary speed for example when i was at cardiff i used to see him a lot and i would never have known that he yeah. had mental health issues because we used to go out we used to have a few beers we used mm -hmm. to have a laugh and it, it, and then that happened and I was like man I can't believe yeah. that even like, looking back yeah, even looking you couldn't back, put your finger on anything anything I couldn't believe yeah. it it was like unbelievable to me um, and you know these things are happening more and more now so I think it's great that the Premier League and the clubs are really looking into that and helping uh, helping players emotionally because yeah. that's a big thing and I think ultimately when clubs help their players emotionally it's only going to help them perform better on the pitch mm. and help them be happier and more peaceful than, with themselves. Definitely. Yeah, nice. But look, to wrap, wrap this up, we're gonna, I've got a quick fire round for you. Uh, just, just like <laughs> top, top of your uh, head. Top, look, man, I'm looking at questions from ask them. <laughs> only a few, yeah. So um, ask as quick as pots. Dream career other than football. Don't limit yourself. <laughs> anything, anything whatsoever. A dream career. I'm, NBA. NBA? Yeah. You probably you got the physique for it, do you? I know, point guard, but not this not, <laughs> not the center. Uh number one biggest challenge in your career? Changing my attitude. Nice. You can change one thing in football, what would it be? Uh <laughs> this is not even quick fire. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're the quickest so far. You're the quickest so far. Okay, so okay. Um I like the idea with Arsene Wenger come up with no throw ins, kick ins. Is it? I like that. I okay. think it keeps the game moving quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, cool. Because you can, you like, can hand on, that. yeah, hit. hand on, bang. Because you can okay. hit cross with balls, right? Yeah, so yeah, keep yeah. the game flowing more. We're it's throwing. Kind of, yeah, there'll be mad transitions, you know. That's what I mean. But with a throwing, you can only throw. It. Most most people are not Rory the lap. They can't throw it into the box yeah, from the yeah. halfway line, you know. Nice. Um, best advice for footballers financially. Um, think about life after football. From what age do you think? The beginning. Very, very beginning. Very beginning. The okay. first time you earn your, your, you know, your first professional contract, you need to think about how you, because a, football, a footballer's life is short. You need to mm. think about how you can manage your money t to sustain your lifestyle for the rest of your life. Yeah. You know, because you're going to have kids. You want to send them private school. You, you know, you're going to have responsibilities as you get older. So you've got them. Yeah. Got you. Um, you kind of answer this a little bit, but maybe you, you may have another one or repeat it. Any regrets? My, um, my regret would be throwing my shirt at, at, at Don Howe. That's a regret I would have yeah. because I feel that I could have, I mean, even Arsene Wenger said it was in the paper, man. He said, you know, one of his biggest regrets was letting me leave Arsenal. 
So we'll get that, that, we'll be... get that up on the B-roll a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so that was that was my biggest Back regret. Up evidence. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I love that, man. No, I appreciate you coming on. <laughs> no, it's been Thank cool, you, man. man. Thank you. Cheers, bro. Cool, man. Thank you.